invite you to stand. You have a short conductor here. Now I invite you to really think of the words. Is this working? I don't know. Is this working? OK, thank you. I invite you to think of the words. I love the message. But also, sing with your heart. Olivia. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Oh
memory verse for today is found in Hebrews 12. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Were they indeed for a few days chased us and as seemed best to them? But we for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, now no chasing seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We are very blessed today, very blessed. Let's ask the Lord to give us understanding as we open his word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings you've poured out into our hearts, to our families, to this world, the gift of your own son. Father, win our hearts to loyalty to you by your faithfulness and loyalty to us, by your love for us. Speak to our hearts today. Um, lift them up toward you, I pray, and give us understanding in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Just whenever you get that. What's that? It's not going. No. I totally <laughs> forgot to do that. Wow, that's a first. It's second. Oh, it's the second. My bad. <laughs> uh, all right, well, thankfully, we can start because the first portion of what we're going to cover, we're not going to have on the screen. Open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Today, we're going to discuss... We're continuing in our series on character building, specifically drawing lessons from um, the instruction, the chastening, and the, the things that ancient Israel went through, especially during this time just before and during the rebuilding of the temple. Because as we have, as we have studied, them rebuilding that temple is akin to the rebuilding that God wants to be doing in us. Each one of us, we found, the Bible says we are living what? Temples, temples or stones. We are part of his temple. And God is polishing us to be fitted together in the heavenly temple. And that polishing, as we've learned, takes place here and now. Um, one of the means that um, God uses to polish and to build our character is trials, temptations, chastening, the Bible calls it in some places. And as the Bible, as, as James read for us, the Apostle Paul says, no chastening seems joyful for the present time. Could you agree with that? while you're going through difficulty, while you're going through trial, we're tempted to, to throw our hands up and say, why, why is this happening to me? Or why should I bother continuing the struggle? But what does the Apostle Paul say? He says, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And this is what we're going to study. Character building today in light of trials, temptations, and chastening. So we're going to Daniel 9 because Daniel is 
giving this beautiful prayer and the chastening that ancient Israel and Judah received, they were carried captive to Babylon. And in this prayer, we're going to understand something about why. Take a look. We'll start with verse 4, Daniel 9, verse 4. The Bible says this, And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have, wicked, we have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. Daniel just simply confesses, you keep mercy to those who love you and keep his commandments, but we have not kept, the, kept your word. You sent us prophets, we did not listen, we turned away. He continues, jump down with me to verse 9. Well, let's start in verse 8. The Lord, he says, O Lord, to us belongs shame of face. To our kings, our princes, and our fathers. Why? Because we have sinned against you. This is what Daniel is, is saying. We're, we have been shamed, we have been brought low, and it's our own fault. That's what he's saying. Verse 10, but to the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us by his servants the prophets. Yes, even all Israel has transgressed your law and departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Jump down with me to verse 16. Then Daniel prays this. He says, O Lord, according to all of your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, from your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, O God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. You know, How many of us are in the same boat with Judah? Are we always constantly faithful to the Lord? No. We stumble, we fall, sometimes rebelliously, sometimes by mistake. But we have no right to ask God for his mercy. God in his mercy and goodness pours it out on us anyhow. But when we do ask, we should ask the same way that Daniel does here, in humility, and he even says, it's not because of our righteous deeds that we're asking you this, but because of your great mercy. Isn't that what Hebrews says when he says, we should come boldly before the throne of what? Grace. When we stumble and fall, when we, when we do things that have, that have distressed God, that have hurt ourselves, the throne of grace is where we need to go. Jesus said, everyone who comes unto me, I will never cast out. There is the throne of grace. And so Israel and Judah found themselves in this situation because of their own unfaithfulness. Notice God's promise. When Solomon originally, let me have the next slide there, Holly. Thank you. When Solomon originally dedicated the temple he asked the Lord, he said, 
When we do evil, when we do wrong, when we go astray, hear from heaven prayer that's made in this place and forgive. Whether you send drought or you send an army or you send something else. And this God heard the prayer of Solomon and this is what God responded. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Daniel was doing just this on behalf of the nation. I'm sure there were other Jews that were realizing the 70 years of captivity were coming to an end. I'm sure there were others that were lifting their prayers as well. But Daniel, even in this prayer, says, we have not made our prayer and confession before you. These are the conditions to receiving mercy. God says, if my people will humble themselves, if they will pray, if they will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and forgive. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. The, um, this, this is also an interesting, interesting scripture here. Jeremiah 2 verse 19 tells us this. Your own wickedness will correct you, and your backslidings will rebuke you. You know what? God allows the things that come upon us to happen, but they are not all from him, as if it was his first choice for us. Do you understand that? Take a look at this scripture. This scripture, Jeremiah is telling us that our own sins will correct us, our own backslidings away from God. They rebuke us. He goes on, Know therefore, God says, and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. Not everything that comes to us comes directly from God as if he's vindictive. The things that happen to us many times we bring on ourselves. And we need to be wise. The Lord can open up our eyes and and make us to understand that it's our own wicked way, our own evil, that has brought us to the circumstances that we come into. Many people do not want to come face to face with that because that means they have to take a certain amount of responsibility. And this is not a culture or a people right now that wants to take responsibility. You understand that, right? It wasn't my fault. It was my parents. It wasn't my fault. It was the woman that you gave me. We have been placing blame since the very beginning. Satan, even in heaven, said, it's not my fault. Your law is too strict. It's too harsh. It cannot be kept. But the Bible here tells us that our own wickedness will correct us. You know, if we're not willing to listen to the chastisement and rebuke and correction of God done in love, then he will let us go and our own sin and wickedness will correct us. I'd rather be chastised and exhorted by my heavenly Father. You know, this is what I believe Paul meant when he said, let such a one go to Satan. Remember there was, there was someone in the church of Corinth who was doing things against the law of God and he told them, let them go and be chastised by, by the ruler that he's chosen, essentially. Let Satan bring about the, the natural outflowing of his own choices. This is very, you know, when the prodigal son went into a far country thinking my father's a harsh taskmaster, I don't want to serve him. His own choices rebuked and corrected him, did they not? He wasted all his wealth. He found that he had nothing. All the friends that were friends while he had money disappeared. And he finally, the Bible says, he finally came to himself. The light turned on and he said, you know what? It was much better for me to be as even a servant and serving my father in his house than it is for me right now. Our own wickedness and evil will correct us. That does not mean that that's God's first choice for you. And that does not mean that God is bringing that upon you and say, ah, take some of that, you deserve it. 
Our own choice brings us to these things. Our own backsliding and evil bring us to these kinds of situations. There's another reason why we may fall into persecution or trials. Jesus tells us, Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, he says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for what reason? For righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. For my name's sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The reason I bring these two scriptures to light is to, I don't know, this is something that made sense to me. Trials and temptations come. Difficulties come. Sometimes, in the worst case, they are a result of our own choice. My own sin brings me to ruin. It pains me. It hurts me. It causes those who love me to suffer. On the one hand, those things, your own evil will chasten you. On the other hand, sometimes we suffer trial for righteousness' sake. And we have done nothing wrong. Jesus, was Jesus persecuted? Was he hunted? Was, he, was his life, was his life um, in danger all the time? Yes. Was it for any evil that he had done? No. So there, there is persecution in this world. Sometimes we bring it on ourselves by our own choice. Sometimes it's brought on because Satan hates Christ. And if he can hurt and discourage and damage those who are seeking to follow him, he feels like he's won a victory. And sometimes, this is the, this is the trap that we've been studying Job in the quarterly. This is the trap that sometimes we fall into. There is trials, there are temptations, there are difficulties and challenges for every one of us who live on this planet. And our biggest question we want to know is why? Why? And didn't Job's friends come to him and say, Job, you know why? I'm going to tell you why. Right here. Because of your own sin. Didn't they do that? Did they discourage a righteous man by doing this? Yes. Yes, they did. They spoke what was not right about Job and about God. We know from the, because the story is unfolded to us that Job was being persecuted for this reason, wasn't he? For righteousness' sake. Satan said, he only serves you, God, because you give him all of these blessings. Too often we are... We are wanting to know the answer to why. Why, why? What is the ultimate good that's going to come out of this? Why am I being persecuted? Remember the disciples, there was this man who was blind and Jesus would heal him, but the disciples asked Jesus a question. And their question is revealing. They said, Does, is this man blind because of his own sin? Or was it the sin of his parents that has caused him to be blind? What did Jesus say? He said, this man has done no wrong. He is blind so that my father may be glorified through his healing. Now, did God allow that, that man to be born blind? Yes. We live in a sinful world. God has allowed many of the choices that we make to come to their natural conclusion, the choices that our families have made. Through no fault of his own, he was born blind. But it was for the glory of God that he was made to see. Here's, here's, the, here's what I want us to understand. We can either get stuck asking the question why, or we can move away from why and say, God, I'm in a tough spot right now. You've allowed this to come to me. What do you want me to learn? How would you have me grow? And depend and depend on you in this situation because here's what happens when we're in the why why me we're raging we are hurting we are we are rolling in the pain essentially we have not accepted it we we feel it is unjust and I will tell you it is unjust 
we are subjected to pain because of our destroyer who brought things upon not only this world but the whole universe. That was never God's first choice. Understand that clearly, okay? But we are, if we never move past the why question, we will never grow. There, we need to move past why and say, all right, Lord, this is my situation. This is what I mean. It is painful here. God knows that. He understands that. But if we can move past the why and say, God, help me to depend on you in this. Give me strength in the middle of this difficulty. Help me not to be questioning so much why, but help me now, Lord, how? Let me ask the word, the, the question, how? How can I grow? How can I glorify you? How are you going to deliver me from this? You know, the Bible says that um, many are the afflictions of the righteous man. What else does it say? The Lord delivers him out of them all. So we have a choice. If we can roll in the pain and keep asking why and be angry and be wounded and hurt, or we can say, Lord, this is the situation I'm in. I accept it. I don't like it. But now let me move from why to how. How are you going to glorify your name? How are you going to deliver me from this? How are you going to teach me to become more dependent on you? How are you going to save me from this? That is where God wants us to go. He needs us to make that transition. And for our own good, we need to make that transgression, that transition. Hebrews 12 tells us this. Paul says, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you, God speaking to you as sons? And then he quotes from Proverbs, which says this, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure this chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Let me ask you fathers. You know, when I was, when I was um, a little boy, my father gave me guitar lessons. I'm thankful that he did. I wish I had taken more lessons from my father. My father is a very accomplished classical guitarist. Everything that I know, I learned from him. But as a seven-year-old boy, my father would chasten me on the guitar. It was difficult for me to take. Many of my lessons with my father would end with me in tears. But why was my father being hard on me? I was seven years old. I was trying to play a full-size guitar. There was only so much my fingers could do. But he wanted more from me. He was demanding more. For what purpose? He wanted me to learn. He wanted me to grow. He wanted me even to exceed him on the guitar. This is what God is doing for us. This is why we as parents chasten our little ones so that they might grow. Do you want your children to grow up to be reprobates and to be lawless? No. We want them to be positive, good, contributing members of society. This is what Paul is saying. If, if you endure the chastening that God, God is dealing with you as sons and daughters, what son is there whom a father does not chasten? And he says this, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. It would be wrong for me to apply the rod to one of your children because I am not that child's father. Only the father or mother can do that because only the father and mother have invested and poured in love and time into the life of this child. It would not be understood coming from me as love. It can only come, the, Bi the Bible says here that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Verse 9, he says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. We pay them respect. Should we not much more be readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? 
For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, speaking of our human fathers. But he, our heavenly father, for our profit is chastening us. And what is his purpose? So that we may be partakers of what? His holiness. Do you understand that holiness, it brings peace. It brings life. It brings righteousness. The fruit of righteousness is beautiful. There's harmony in the home. There is no strife. This is what God wants to bring us to. This is his purpose. And then he says this. No chastening seems to be joyful at the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And this is a very important phrase. I don't want you to miss it. It will only yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. In order to be trained by the chastening, we have to move from why to how. Because if we stay in why, then we're being chastened, we're being hurt, and we're saying, this is unfair, God, why are you doing this to me? We, we begin to blame. But if we move and we say, all right, Lord, you are allowing this. It may not be your first choice for me, but you're allowing it. I will be subjected to you in this, and I'm going to see how are you going to glorify your name? How are you going to cause me to depend more upon you? How are you going to deliver me from this trouble? I'm waiting. I'm expectant. This is where the Bible, and this is where growth happens. While we were chafing, you know, there was, um, there was a, a girl in the Pathfinder Club that I was connected with, involved with and uh, it was a Sabbath afternoon and we were going for a hike and it was a it was a fairly long hike it was about a mile and a half or two miles and this girl knew it was a long hike and she did not want to go she whined she complained she moaned but she knew that she was going to have to go we started up the trail and there she was I don't want to go I don't have you know she's going but she's just totally not having any fun. So I came alongside her and I, 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 I said, you know what? You know, you're walking with us. You know you have to come. You have a choice. You can either accept it and begin to be happy and have a good time with the rest of the people who are here or you can continue to be upset and whine and wish you were somewhere else. In that case, you will be miserable the whole way up, the whole way back, and you're going to make everyone around you miserable with you. What do you want to choose? If we're still saying, why? Oh, I don't want to. Lord, this is too hard. And, and we're focused, we stay there. Then we're going to be miserable no matter what we're going through. And if you stay there long enough, the actual trial will disappear, but you'll still stay complaining. Good things will actually be happening and you'll be looking for something to complain about. I can tell you that because I have cultivated this myself. When things begin to change, I'm still looking at all the, all the little things that are going wrong. God is chastening us as, as sons. He loves us and it's to bring about a positive, beautiful change in our life. Notice what God says here in Psalms 32. He promises this. I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. And I will guide you with my eye upon you. Just as a father is following his son while he's taking his first few pedals on the bicycle and knows he could fall down. The father is right behind us. He is guiding us with his eye upon us. He is leading us and instructing us in the way that we should go. But notice what the next verse says. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, but which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle, or else they will not come near you. God is saying, don't fight my instruction. Listen. It will go easier if you obey. You ever, I, I have not personally ridden a horse. But I imagine if that horse is not wanting to obey the commands of its rider, 
And that rider is a strong rider and pulling at that bit and that harness, that, that horse is gonna have an awfully rough time. Instead of learning and saying, all right, I will, I will listen to the commands. Then the commands can be gentle and the horse will go the direction it's supposed to. God's saying, don't be like a mule. And then he says this, many sorrows will be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Let me ask you, is it always easy to trust the Lord in a difficult situation? It's not. But the promise is those who trust him, mercy, God's mercy will surround them. I want to share with you from Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 9, this beautiful, now this is, this is right during the heart of the time when God's people are rebuilding the sanctuary. This is what they're remembering. And by the way, the, you can read the few verses right before this. Nehemiah remembers when Israel built a golden calf and worshipped it. So this is right after Israel's great sin, after God had saved them from the Egyptians, drowned the army that was trying to destroy them, fed them with, with manna in the wilderness, and given them their law, his law. He invited them to become his bride. This is how they responded. And, and then he says this, God, yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud, it did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire did it depart from them by night to show them light and the way they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Notice this. God gives them his Holy Spirit to do what? To instruct them. Is God more faithful with his ancient people than he is with us today? No. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Notice in the heart of the book of Haggai, they are struggling to rebuild the temple. Many things, many forces are being, all, Satan is bringing all of Sanballat and uh, the, the three others, the two others that are fighting against them to, to keep the temple from being rebuilt. And God says this, Yet now, Zerubbabel, be strong, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. Why? For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out from Egypt, so my spirit remains where? Among you. You know, this is, this is the temptation that the people were dealing with at this time. The physical manifestations of God's presence and glory were with them when they came out of Egypt. When they came out of Babylon, there did not seem to be physical. There was no cloud that led them from Babylon back to Jerusalem. When they dedicated and set up the altar, there was no fire that came down from heaven that burnt up the offering, like there was when Solomon first dedicated the temple, or when Moses first dedicated the tabernacle. There seemed to be no outward physical manifestation that God was with them. But what did God say? He said, the same way that I promised you that I was with you when you first came out, I am still with you now. Do you know that we need that same, we need that same rebuke and exhortation? How many of you have heard, and maybe some of us have been that, that very one, we've asked questions, well, there was healings in Jesus' day. There were miracles in, in the day that God brought the Christian church out. Where are those miracles today? The same God who said, I will be with you and lead you in the way you should go is the same God who is with us today. In fact, you know what God tells them in Haggai? You know, when they finish building the temple, it looks so lame. 
to the old men who had seen Solomon's beautiful, grandiose temple, they said they began to cry when they, when they set the final stone in place. They were weeping. And you know what God told them? He said, don't weep. I'm going to make this temple more glorious than the one you knew before. How did God fulfill this? Jesus, the Shekinah, God himself in human flesh, walked among the precincts of that temple. They had spent years. Rome had sent marble. Herod had spent 46 years trying to rebuild this this dilapidated um, post-Babylonian temple to bring it back to the grandeur of Solomon's day. And even by the time of Christ, it was a pretty beautiful temple. But it was nothing in comparison with Jesus himself, the Shekinah, God himself walking amongst that place. What is that telling? What does that tell us? What is the lesson for us? God is going to make us a polished and beautiful temple. It's not going to be outward. It's going to be because Christ is inward. He is in us. We need the same help in building the temple. Um, Zechariah, let's see if I have it. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. This is a message to the governor at this time. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power. You are going to rebuild this temple by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by fighting with Sanballat or the others. It's not by any of those things. My spirit is going to work for you. And then he says this. Who are you, O great mountain? Whatever trials, whatever temptations, whatever difficulties, they come before you. Zerubbabel before you. God is going to make them a plain. And he, Zerubbabel, is going to bring forth the capstone of this temple with shouts of grace, grace to it. This is the same promise that God gives to us as we say, I will build the character that God has asked me to build. We need the Holy Spirit to build that Take a look at this, First, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. Now, the Cor- Corinthians were, they were Gentiles, but the city of Corinth itself was known to be a very despicable and low place. Um, the character of the people that lived in Corinth, they were adulterers, They were homosexuals, they were thieves, they were gluttons, they were drunkards. Even the women of Corinth had a very bad reputation. I want you to notice what Paul writes to them. Look at this. Paul says this, Do we begin to commend ourselves to you, or do we need as others epistles or letters of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You know, there was was also a battle going on in the church whether... Paul was really an apostle or whether they should be listening to Apollos and all of this. And Paul says, listen, forget about all that. That I don't care about titles. We preach the word to you. You believed it. Look what God did for you. Look what God did in you. That is the certificate that the gospel is powerful and true. He says, you, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. And clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. You are no longer thieves and drunkards and homosexuals. You are none of those things. You're a new creation. Christ has written on your heart. Notice the next verse here. You are not written with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on the tablets of the flesh, that is, of the heart. The Holy Spirit was writing his law, love to God with all the heart, mind, and soul, and love to the neighbor on the hearts of the Corinthians. This, Paul says, is the letter that commends us. And then he says this, and we have this trust towards, uh, we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we of ourselves to think of of anything as being from ourselves. We know this wasn't us. But our sufficiency, 
our strength to preach this gospel is coming from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the old letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit, writing that same law on your heart, how will his ministry be, I'm sorry, not be more glorious? God is going to work in his people and he's going to build a character if we will submit to him, if we will trust him. It calls for patience. It calls for perseverance. There's a word in the Greek, it's, it's hupomene, uh, uh, hupo, hupomone, I believe. Um, and this is what it means. It means a steadfastness, a constancy, an endurance, not, not to be swerved from a deliberate purpose or swerved from loyalty to faith and piety, even in the greatest trials and suffering. It's patient, it's steadfast. A, a patient and steadfast waiting for, a patient enduring, a sustaining, a perseverance. That's what this word means. And let me share with you scriptures where it is found. They relate to character building. Notice what James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, and there's the word, hupomone, the testing of our faith by trials and tribulations produces patience. It produces steadfast loyalty in the face of difficulty. If we're not willing to be trained by it, it will not produce the fruit of righteousness. But if we are, it will produce, our faith will produce patience. And then notice what he says in the next verse. But let patience have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Is God able to do that for us? It's through trials and temptations. Take a look at another scripture here from Romans 5. I'm going to skip the beginning part of this. Not only this, not only do we have justification by faith through Jesus, but we also glory in what? In tribulations. Knowing that tribulations produce what? There is the word, hupomone. It produces, tribulation produces this patience, this loyalty even under difficulty. And that patience produces what? Character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And if we have the Holy Spirit, heaven is mine, Jesus is mine, eternal life is mine, and peace and joy can be mine right now, right here. I don't have to wait for it. Here's another scripture from Revelation 14 in connection with the end times. We know this. After all that Satan is doing in Revelation 13 and 14, the beast and the dragon and all of this, here is what? The patience of the saints. Same word, hupomone. Here is the endurance, the steadfast loyalty in the face of difficulty. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do we need patience? Do we need endurance? We do. This is melted silver, molten silver. It has to be heated to 1,763 degrees before it melts. When it does melt, the dross, the impurities, the other irons uh, or whatever is there, you can see it gathered all around, the, all around the edges. Can't you? This reddish. Those are impurities. They are being burned off. They are being skimmed off. And what remains 
is the pure, beautiful metal. Now, if a smith heats this too, too long or too hot, he will lose some of that precious metal. And so he has to know exactly the right temperature. Too hot, he'll destroy. He'll destroy a portion of it. If he doesn't get it hot enough, the junk and the crud and the dross, will re- the slag will remain. Do you know that God knows this? He knows just how hot and how difficult the trials in our life have to be to be able to produce this in our lives and get rid of this. Let me share a scripture with you. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The Bible's telling us exactly this. No temptation has overtaken you. No trial has come to you except that which is common to man. You're not the only one going through this. But God is what? Faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted what? Beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that what? You may be able to bear it. God has strength and power to give to everyone who calls on him in that time of need. And there is the promise of it. Here's another scripture, Job 23. You remember Job's experience being persecuted for righteousness sake, even by his friends. This is what Job says. God, he knows the way that I have taken. He knows my heart. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as what? As gold. Zechariah 13 says the same thing. God says, I will bring, by the way, you don't want to be part of the two-thirds If you want to know what happens to the two-thirds, read the few verses before this in Zechariah 13. This is what God says about the one-third. I will bring that one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined. I will test them as gold is tested. Then uh, they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people. And each one will say, the Lord is is my God. And one last one from Malachi 3. The question is asked, who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. This is speaking of a day not far off. Who will be able to stand? Notice the answer is here. God is going to sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. He will purge them as gold and silver so that they may offer to the Lord an offering of righteousness. Now here's the question. The day that is burning like an oven is coming. If you have allowed God to chasten you and you have learned and moved away from why into how, how can I grow? How can you be glorified? How will you deliver me from this trial? When that day comes, you will shine forth as purest gold and silver. But if you have not and you have allowed the slag and the defilement and the rest of the things to stay in your life and not joined with God in building a character that will withstand the fire. When that day comes, the slag, the dross, the impurity, it will be burned up. But you will also be burned up with it. Let God do the work now in your life. Move away from why and raging against pain and hurt, and say, God, here I am. It hurts. I'm suffering. And you know what? When when people hurt, we should weep with them. Isn't that what the Bible says? This is not necessarily the time to go up to them, pat them on the back, and say, this is all for your good. It will be okay. Do you understand that? I hope you understand that. When someone is hurting, We have the command to weep with those who weep, to draw near to them, to lift them up in prayer, and however else we can can help them. But when you yourself are in the fire, don't forget 
God has a plan for you. He is bringing, to bring you forth as gold and silver refined. Jesus went through the same thing. I want to sh- look, at, look at the agony that Jesus has. This is, this is still, the cross is still somewhat far away, but look at what Jesus says. This is in Luke 12. Jesus says this, I came to send fire on the earth, but how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus is saying, I wish I was beyond the cross. I wish the cross was not still in front of me. But what else does he say? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. What else does Jesus say? There in the garden, he took two of his best, three of his best friends, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. He began to be deeply sorrowful and distressed. And he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Do you see how Jesus as a son is subjecting himself even to the tribulation and the trial that God is father? God is the one who holds the cup to Jesus' lips because he loves him and because he loved us. Then he came to the disciples and he found them asleep and he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Even Jesus needed sympathy in this hour. We need to remember that. We need to give sympathy to each other. And Hebrews tells us this, in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, he was heard because of his godly fear. But though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. You cannot learn obedience while asking why. You can only learn obedience stepping into how. And God will take us to that place. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all who obey him. You know what Jesus is going to say in the kingdom? The Bible tells us in in Isaiah 53, Speaking of this exact experience, the whole chapter of Isaiah, this is what it says. That Jesus is going to look back on the travail and trial that his soul went through and be satisfied because by his knowledge and experience in that trial, Jesus, God's righteous servant, has justified many for he has borne our iniquities. Don't ask why in the, in, the, in the trial. Move away from that question. Ask God how. How will you deliver me? How will you glorify your name? How will you save me? We're going to sing hymn number 414 as we close. 414. Let's rise and sing 414.
chasten us as sons and daughters and that you have not called us illegitimate and not worthy of it but father help us yield and subject ourselves to all that you allow and ask lord how will you glorify your name how will you deliver me from this how will you build and grow my character even in this trial father have your way we do not want to be dross consumed in the fire we want, to be, we want to reflect your image. We want to be this pure silver and gold that you may be glorified. Father, I want to lift up those who are experiencing heavy trials and burdens right now. Send your Holy Spirit to them. Lift their eyes toward Jesus. He walked this very path before us. He has promised us that if we're faithful and we follow him, <coughs> we will have a great reward. Father, bless each one here and teach us to learn from the challenges and trials that come to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.